Good morning. We are going to try to finish the visual system. That, uh, as I mentioned initially, you know, there is too much going on on it from the research point of view and understanding actually how vision works. Uh, at this point, we are going to go more into the central into the central nervous system, starting actually with the optic nerve because, as you may realize, the optic nerve is not a nerve, really. It's a bundle of the central nervous system uh, that is formed by the axons of all the ganglion cells. Now, let's review briefly the objectives of this session, all right? We have to discuss the organization of the central visual pathways the functional role of each segment of the visual pathway, the processing of the visual uh, information at each segment, and finally the characteristic visual field defects caused by lesions of each segment. So it's relatively straightforward, the objectives. We'll see how it goes. We start with the optic nerve. Now, the optic nerve is a collection of all the axons from ganglion cells. The ganglion cells are distributed over the entire retina, right? And remember that there, were, there was a distinction between the central retina, about 20 degrees in diameter, and the rest, which is the peripheral retina. Now, the axons of one and the other behave somewhat differently. Eventually, all the retinal ganglion cells that are all over this space, all over this place, eventually they have to converge in what is called the optic papilla or head of the optic nerve that is all purely nerve fibers and therefore this is what results in a spot of blindness in the visual field when you plot it, when you are putting stimuli exactly in this general area of the retina because there are no receptors. Now you have now that every retinal ganglion cell in each of these locations has to come converging into the head of the optic nerve to form the optic nerve that leaves the eye globe. All right. It happens that from the nasal segment, this will be nasal. All right. The, the nose will be here. All right. From the nasal segment, just in a, in a fan-like fashion, the various retinal ganglion cells would send their axon towards the optic papilla, right? However, from the, um, from the temporal portion of the retina, which is this part, the right, temporal portion of the retina, you can see that the ganglion cells are taking some arcuate course because there is nothing that can cross this horizontal meridian in the temporal portion of the retina. The reason for that is that embryologically, the whole globe has been the result of an invagination. And the edges of that invagination that eventually fuse are not really crossed by any element, call it ganglion cell axons or even blood vessels. So when you look at the fundus of the eye globe, which I don't have the representation here, you see that there is an area from the center to the outer portion of the retina that is devoid of any blood vessels or crossings. That we call the horizontal uh, meridian. So, and uh, from the peripheral retina, that's the course that they take. A similar thing happens with ganglion cells that are ganglion cells that are in the central retina. For instance, you have here that from the nasal portion of the retina, the fibers straight go into the head of the optic nerve, whereas from the temporal portion, they have this arcuate course again, because they cannot cross the meridian, all right? Now you have all these things collected in the head of the optic nerve, but look what's happening here, that you have an, a region that, of the optic nerve uh, head that is collecting all the information from the macula, see? and the rest will be for peripheral. The end result of that is that there is like a bundle of fibers of retinal ganglion cell axons that come from the macula into the head of the optic nerve to collect in this region. That's what is called the maculopapillar bundle because they go from the macula to the papilla. 
and that it collects the entire central central vision, which is the discriminative vision, right? As you know, it's got uh, uh, photopic vision. Now you have the optic nerve coming out of the eye globe, right? and you see that the location of the macular papillar bundle changes the, the, the further you go into the optic nerve. For instance, here, that the optic nerve, here you see that goes a little bit towards the center and more to the center. Eventually, it becomes all central, this uh, macropapillar bundle. Why is this important? Because it so happened that, uh, uh, as Dr. Bender used to say, that the characteristic field defects that are due to problems, in, in this case in the optic nerve, always take the fibers that somehow rearrange themselves. We, see, we will see that in different in consecutive segments. But in the optic nerve, obviously the fibers that rearrange themselves are forming the maculopapillar bundle. That, as you saw, have seen right now, it changes location within the nerve itself. And so, what happens with the lesion of the optic nerve? I'm talking about a lesion of the optic nerve, save, you know, a cut. If you cut the whole optic nerve, obviously that eye will be blind completely. The whole visual field is is uh, is uh, absent. But in this case, the pathology of the optic nerve doesn't have to be a section of the optic nerve. It can be an inflammation, an optic neuritis, it can be a tumor, it can be a tumor in the orbit pressing on the nerve, it can be demyelination you know, things that are characteristic, for instance, in MS, that being a, a central nervous system bundle, the optic nerve is very, is very much, uh, you know, at risk for demyelination in MS. can be also toxic metabolic, can be vascular, it can be all kinds of etiologies, but the resulting field effect is always the same, which is what is called a central scotoma, which means an area of blindness in the center of the field of one eye, for instance, like that. You can be denser in this portion, less dense here, but the essential thing is that takes, as you can see, one eye only, and then it takes both sides, right and left side of that eye. Right? This is what is called the central scotoma, it means that the central vision in this eye is compromised and consequently when you test that eye, the person will have troubles in discriminating color, the acuity will be poor, the, all, the, all the functions that are characteristic of the central deficit, the retina will be at deficit. So you have a patient of this sort with this kind of visual field, one eye normal, the other eye with a central scotoma, you can be 100% positive that the problem is in the corresponding optic nerve, in this case of the left eye. Right. By the way, you see that the designation of visual fields, as we did it initially in the previous uh, segment, uh, the left eye, you can say left eye and right eye, but sometimes you use this um, nomenclature that the left eye is OS and the right eye is, uh, is OD. This is Latin for oculus sinistrus and oculus dextrus right and left eye. You can see it both ways. All right, now let's see what happens when you go back in the optic nerves and you know that eventually the optic nerves will get confluent and make a midline structure that is called the optic chiasm. So what is happening here in the optic chiasm? Let's take a look. You have here the left and the right side and you have here uh, the the left eye and the right eye, all right? And you can see also here that the visual field of the left eye will be something like this. That will be the visual field of the left eye, all right? And the visual field has a temporal quadrant and have nasal quadrants. We went through this already. And you see that because the lens system is a positive lens system, when the information goes through the lens system, gets reversed. That means that the temporal field will project to the nasal retina, and the nasal field will project to the center, to the temporal retina. 
and that's true for both eyes, of course. Now it's represented here, uh, therefore, the visual field, the, le the lens system, the retina, covering internally the eye globe, then you have the optic nerve, then you have this optic chiasma that is formed, and from the optic chiasma it will come out the optic tracts. Let's see what actually happens. This is what I said before about the reversal, right? But now you have, let's say, uh, ganglion cells in the nasal retina of the left eye. These ganglion cells are going to cross to the opposite side and join the opposite optic tract. Whereas the fibers that are coming from, and, 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 and similar, see, the, the opposite side does the same thing. That means that the ganglion cell axons that are coming from nasal retinas or both eyes are going to cross to the opposite side. Right? On the other hand, the axons that uh, are coming from the temporal retina, they stay on the same side, on one side and the other. So what are we having here? Essentially, we are having a, a hemidecusation, meaning decusation means the crossing, and hemidecusation means that half of the fibers about cross and half do not cross, roughly. All right, um, it's, um, uh, let me see if we can um, go back one second. Um, see, this, this distinction here of nasal retina to the opposite side and temporal retina to the ipsilateral side, it's true for the greater part of the retina but when it's very close to the center of fixation, there is some kind of confusion there in nature, so that there are ganglion cells that are close to the vertical meridian that come from the nasal side and they do not cross. And there are some in the temporal side that should stay in the same side and they do cross. So there is some kind of a confusion along the, along, along the vertical meridian and that gives rise to um, problems that we'll discuss uh, in a moment, all right? Now, suppose you have a lesion of the optic chiasm in this general area, right? You know, following that general precept of thinking, well, the fibers that are going to be primarily affected are the crossing fibers because they rearrange themselves, right? They don't stay on the same side, they just cross. So what would happen with problems in the optic chiasm? And the problem of the optic chiasm can be multiple, right? Because it is so located at the base of the brain and on the, on the skull that they have various, um, various components there that are prone to have problems. For instance, you can have an arachnoiditis of the chiasmatic system, you know, an infection. You can have a tumor of the sphenoid reach, in the, like a meningioma on one side. You can have an aneurysm of the carotid artery that will press from one side, right? The side of the, of the uh, aneurysm of that carotid artery. Uh, the problem and the interesting thing is that no matter from where, oh, you have also the pituitary hanging behind and below the chiasm, that you get the tumor of the pituitary and presses on the chiasm in the middle line. This is well understood in terms of what happens in the field effect, but what is not clear is what happens when you are pressing from the side, never mind from where. What's happening is that the pathology that can be multiple, I just, just told you, will give you a problem with the crossing fibers. Now the crossing fibers are coming from temporal fields of each eye, right? nasal retinas, temporal fields of each eye, and therefore, what the field effect that is going to be caused by a lesion of the chiasm of any kind of pathology and from any source, it will be affecting the temporal quadrants of both eyes, all right? In what is called a bitemporal heteronymous because it's the right side of the right eye and the left side of the left eye means that there are of different sides, therefore it's heteronymous. And because it is bitemporal, uh, because it affects the temporal uh, fields, it's called the bitemporal field effect. Now, 
Here I'm showing a very large field effect, right, affecting both eyes. But you can have a small, a small area of defect in one eye and another small area of defect on the other eye. But the, 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 the feature of being bitemporal, the defects of each eye are on different sides for each eye, makes it a characteristic pattern of charismatic lesion, which is the bitemporal field effect. If it's very full like this one, will be a bitemporal hemianopsia, as we discussed initially. In this case, we can call it that way, but know that sometimes only one quadrant is affected, but the, the feature or the, 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 the property of being bitemporal locates the lesion to the optic chiasm. All right, what happens after the optic chiasm, as you remember, uh, uh, from this general layout, it comes the optic tract, right? Now, in the optic tract, uh, we can go back to the visual fields, but now, and, and the uh, cor corresponding inversion here, the usual thing, right? But you see now that the nasal field of the left eye goes to the temporal retina, right? And the temporal retina, following the pattern that we mentioned before, stays on the same side and goes to the ipsilateral optic tract. And you see now that the, the uh, ganglion cells from the nasal retina of the right eye that are receiving information from the temporal field of that eye are the ones that cross and collect in the opposite optic tract. So essentially what we are saying in this case is that the left optic tract is collecting information from the right fields of both eyes. All right? And that's, you know, this is, this is adding the cross fibers, the corresponding cross fibers, but the pattern, therefore, of an optic tract problem is such that it is a homonymous field effect, not heteronymous like in the chiasm, is the same side for each eye, is the right field of the right eye and the right field of the left eye. And as you can see, it's also contralateral because this is the left optic tract that is collecting information from the right fields of both eyes. That's, that's essentially what is, called, uh, what is called a contralateral homonymous field effect. That is, if it's complete, is the contralateral homonymous hemianopsia. Right? This is unusual. That the pathology be restricted to the optic tract is, is rare. But when it happens, the pattern of this function is exactly what we are saying. The pattern of this function is retrochiasmatic and therefore is going to be a contralateral homonymous defect or hemianopia in this case. So in this case, in this particular example, you see that the lesion is on the right side of the brain, in this case the right optic tract, right? Because it's collecting information from the left fields of both sides. Now, notice also that uh, the, mm, the vertical meridian here is not fully blind and there is some preservation of central vision even on the hemianopic field. That's what is called the macular sparing phenomenon that is always under discussion, uh, but one definite finding is what I told you before, that at the retinal level in the vertical meridian, there is not such a very strict segregation of the right versus the left side in terms of crossing or uncrossing. Now, at this point, we can, um, we can summarize the situation because now, now, once you are in the optic tract, you are in one side of the brain and the patterns will be similar in next segments of, uh, of the pathway. Uh, but now you, can, you have to have clear then that we have three patterns of field effects, a pre-chiasmatic, a chiasmatic, and a retrochiasmatic. In the pre Chiasmatic pattern is the optic nerve that is at, at fault, right? And the characteristic field effect will be a central scotoma. In the chiasmatic pattern, it will be a bitemporal hemianopic field effect, or heteronymous. 
And finally, in the retrochiasmatic pattern that starts with the optic track and continues with the rest of the hemisphere, as we are going to see, the pattern will be the same and it will be a contralateral homonymous field effect. Now, most of the fibers of the optic tract, if not all, are terminating in a network that belongs to the thalamus. Uh, is a nucleus of the thalamus that is called the lateral geniculate nucleus. That is part of the thalamus, it's a complex network, as most of the networks that we have been discussing so far, and this lateral geniculate nucleus is a very laminated structure. This is a very beautiful picture that I borrowed from Purvis. Uh, very beautiful laminated structure. This is middle line here, right? This middle line and this is lateral. And you can see that there are lamina that are numbered actually 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 in each geniculate, all right? And the layers 1 and 2 has large cells, and the layers 3 to 6 have small cells. Remember that one of the subdivisions of the ganglion cells in the retina were in the M cells, magno, and P cells, parvo. That continues the segregation in the lateral geniculate nucleus, because you have here the endings or in layer 1 are M ganglion cells from the contralateral eye. In layer 2, there will be M ganglion cells when they, from the ipsilateral eye. And then the pattern continues uh, in some alternation for the P ganglion cells uh, um, in the geniculate coming from the corresponding part of the retina. But, you know, this is maybe a little... You don't have to tax your memory on that. Just remain with the concept. And the concept is that the... M ganglion cells, the retina, terminate in magnocellular lamina, one and two, of the geniculate, that P ganglion cells of the retina terminate in the parvocellular lamina of the geniculate, and that the inputs from each eye remain segregated in the geniculate because the contralateral eye will feed into laminas one, four, and six, whereas the ipsilateral eye will terminate in lamina 2, 3, and 5. So the inputs of each eye remain segregated in the geniculate. And remember that these inputs from the M system and the P system are such that the M system takes care essentially of movement and course outlines, whereas the P cell system takes care of, of um, form and color as attributes of the stimulus that remain in segregated channels of information processing. Now, in terms of what else comes into the geniculate, it's not just, as in the old times, you used to say, well, it's a relay station that so comes the optic tract, terminates, and then the cells in the geniculate will project to the visual cortex, in the cerebral cortex. It's definitely not the case, right? Because you have here a geniculate that receives the optic tract, that that's all we were saying so far, but in addition to that, it receives input from the brainstem, and these are mostly these are mostly the monominergic, the monominergic and cholinergic systems that have groups of cells in the brainstem that project forward and provide the corresponding innervation to the geniculate. It receives also a cerebral cortex input. You know, the main cells in the geniculate eventually there are various kinds of cells, but the main cell, it will project to the cortex, and in turn, the cortex will project back to the geniculate. And finally, the geniculate will also receive a very peculiar input from what is called the thalamic reticular nucleus, which is an inhibitory structure that we will discuss in detail when we deal with the thalamus. But this is just to show you that the geniculate is not just a relay station, it's a complicated network that receives various inputs in addition to this primary input of the optic tract with visual information. Now, the characteristic when you record from cells in the geniculate, they have receptive fields that are very similar to the receptive field of the retina, which means centers around antagonistic uh, and uh, a little bit different in terms that there is a lot of 
inhibitory surround in these cells, all right? Uh, and you have a P-type cell in the geniculum, in parvocellular layers, responding to form and color, the same as in the retina. And N-type cells in magnocellular layers, responding essentially to movement and rough, coarse outlines. But then comes the question, right? So the concept is that separate channels of information processing that starts in the retinal ganglion cells continue to be segregated, separate, in the geniculate. And then you will say, so what do, what do we need the geniculate for? Because it's reproducing essentially what the retina was doing. Well, there are two reasons for that, why we need the geniculate. One is to further processing of visual information by a lot of inhibitory tuning, right? So the information, the visual information continues to be processed in the geniculate in such a way that um, increases contrast, if you wish, in various ways that still involve in separate channels. And when this is projected to the cortex, then the cortex will use that information in the first network in the cortex, with the primary visual area, to keep on processing, and we will see what happens there. But then, the geniculate has another role, being a thalamic nucleus. It gates the information according to states of consciousness. Because, you know, you can be watching television at night and you fall asleep. You fall asleep and through your eyelids, still the different things that are happening in the, in the, in the television screen will project inward. And however you keep on sleeping, it means that the thalamus, the geniculate in this case, is gating the information in various mechanisms that eventually we can discuss in such a way that doesn't let the information continue to the cortex to get conscious level. And on the other hand, in wakefulness, that gate opens and you get more faithful transmission of the information from the thalamic uh, network to the cortex. So that's the reason for the geniculate and the thalamus in general. Now, what about lesions of the geniculate? Very unusual. I said that the lesions of the optic tract were unusual, right? And the lesions of restricted to the geniculate are very unusual too. But perhaps you have a strange case that has this, all right? And it is due to an infarct or whatever in the geniculate. What would be the pattern of receptive field? Well, you know that the geniculate is behind the chiasm. And you know that behind the chiasm, there is a common pattern of dysfunction, which is the retrochiasmatic pattern that occurs in the optic tract, occurs in the geniculate, and it will keep on occurring further uh, towards the cortex. And the pattern is a contralateral homonymous field effect. And that's what the, uh, the geniculate will produce. All right? Now, I said that the information is being processed at the geniculate and is gated according to state of consciousness, and eventually there are output cells of the geniculate that will send their axons to the visual cortex. Right? They form bundles of fibers that are called, together, the optic radiation. That's the output of the geniculate that reaches the cerebral cortex. Right? And it reaches it in not in a completely straight way. Let me, let me show you. Uh, for instance, this is a brain, right? The, the representation, this is the ventricular system, you know, the frontal and the parietal and the occipital and the temporal horns of the ventricle. The location of the geniculate is about here. That's the geniculate. That's where it's located, all right? The location of the visual cortex is in the occipital lobe, which is in this area. Right? And you see that there is a bunch of fibers that are coming from the geniculate and they go straight into the occipital lobe. However, all these fibers, they go to the upper bank of the calcarine fissure, which is the visual cortex, right? And the upper bank is actually looking at inferior quadrants of the field. That means that all these more or less direct fibers from the geniculate taking a relatively straight course to the visual cortex are actually looking at lower quadrants of the visual field. 
those that look at the upper quadrants of the visual field do not go directly from the geniculate to stride, as in this case, but they make a loop like this. All right? They make a loop and they go first rostrally, they go around the ventricle, and then they go to the striate cortex. And that represents this input represent inform represent information from the superior field. So immediately you realize what can happen with lesions, right? Let's see what can happen. Uh, first of all, the radiations are retrochiasmatic, right? The same as the geniculate and the same optic tract. The pattern has to be the same, which means contralateral homonymous field effects. Now, if the problem is here in the parietal lobe, usually catches everything and you have a contralateral homonymous myanopia. But suppose the trouble here is in the temporal lobe, at this level. Suppose a surgeon comes and resects a piece of temporal lobe here, you know, that uh, for, can be used for treatment of uh, uncontrollable epileptic seizures, all right? And a piece of the temporal lobe is chopped. And if he opens the ventricle, you see that the green part is the ventricle, you can be sure that he also damaged these radiations, all right? And what, what kind of field effects you are going to have if these radiations are affected? Well, it's retrochiasmatic, the pattern would be contralateral homonymous. But what part of the visual field would be affected? Well, if these fibers are looking at the upper field, means that the upper quadrants will be affected. So the end result of that will be a contralateral homonymous superior quadrantanopia, which means only the upper quadrants will be, as you can see, is contralateral and is homonymous on the same side for each eye, but it affects only the superior quadrants. That's very characteristic of temporal lobe lesions affecting Mayer's loop. We are continuing now with the visual system. Uh, we left uh, at the optic radiation level, where you have all this projection from the lateral geniculate nucleus. After processing the information and gating it according to the state of consciousness, and reaching now the cerebral cortex. So the first network in the cortex that takes care of this input is called the visual visual cortical area or striate cortex. We'll see why. And in another nomenclature will be the area 17 of Brotman, or it's also called V1, because it's the first cortical network that takes care of this input. Uh, the visual field that we discussed initially is represented in these various uh, regions at the level of the cortex. And here an illustration that I borrowed from uh, Purvis from neuroscience. And you can see now that the that the striate cortex actually is buried within the calcarine fissure on the medial surface of the occipital lobe and overflows a little bit on the surface. So it's in the buried cortex and a little bit on the surface. The important thing to keep in mind is, uh, that, the, is that the visual field is represented so that the upper bank of the calcarine fissure is looking at the inferior quadrants and the lower bank of the fissure uh, is looking at the superior quadrants. So there is already a differentiation there. Moreover, and perhaps even more important, is the fact that central vision, you know, from the macula, the discriminative portion of the visual system, is mostly represented at the very pole of the occipital lobe, in a region, you know, perhaps a little smaller than that, but still taking the pole of the occipital lobe not only on the medial surface, but also on the lateral surface, just the tip of the lobe. Now, when you look at the characteristics of this cortex, you see that there is a, uh, there is a, um, uh, there is a myelin stain, stain in white matter. You see that in this cortex, which is buried in the calcarine fissure, you see in the middle of the cortex a white matter substance. And that white matter substance that is called the stripe of Gennari, uh, is what is giving the cortex the name of striated. 
This is the striped cortex given by this lamina. We'll see in a moment what's all about. All right. Now, if we take now a lesion of the occipital lobe, well, you you know that the, the occipital lobe obviously is uh, is retrochiasmatic, the pattern that we discussed for anything that is behind the optic chiasm, and therefore uh, it will be a contralateral homonymous field effect. And if the whole occipital lobe is involved, it will be a contralateral homonymous hemianopsia. And you have here the two fields, the left eye and the right eye, as usual. And you'll see that in this case, the left field of the left eye and the left field of the right eye are uh, affected uh, with sparing of the macula, as we mentioned earlier. And so this kind of pattern, it will mean that the lesion is, if the left fields are affected, the lesion is on the right side because it's contralateral. All right. Now, we have to um, understand also another interesting clinical point, and that's the fact that sometimes there are lesions of just the occipital pole, of the occipital tip. This happened mostly in traumatic injuries and in, in war casualties, in which a missile just shaves the, the, the very pole in the back of the head and shaves, let's say, an occipital pole with it. What will be now the pattern of this function here in the visual fields? Well, you know two things. First, that it's retrochiasmatic, therefore it will be contralateral homonymous. But what will be the extent of the visual field effect? Well, the pole contains just the macula, the projection of the macula, and therefore, what you're going to have is something like that, that will be small areas of blindness near the center of fixation. And you see that the small, these small areas of blindness that are called scotomata are paracentral, very near the center, right? And they are contralateral homonymous. You know, I'm insisting on this feature because sometimes it's very difficult to detect on, on examination, except for its, with, with special examination. But... Um, uh, it so happened that these patients have tremendous problems. They have problems in reading, they have problems in color, uh, their acuity is low, and they are conscious of, of a very important problem in their vision. Whereas in the previous case, when you have a full contralateral hemianopsia of the entire left-sided fields, uh, the patient doesn't complain much. The macula is usually spared, that they compensate in various ways. But with this kind of lesion, a lot of problems occur. And you should be aware of that. Now, after uh, reviewing then the projection of the field on the occipital lobe and the resulting lesions according to the location, we have to talk about a little bit about the cortical organization. Now, when the Cortex is the general cortex, not non striated, not the striated cortex, all right? The very next door, let's say, to the striated cortex. You see that it has a typical arrangement of the neocortex, which is a six lamina structure, this being the surface and being, this being the depth. So you have lamina one, a molecular layer, then a lamina two, which is an, which is an, um, an outer granular layer that is called the lamina three, which is a, a outer pyramidal, then lamina 4 is the, the inner granular, and lamina 5 that is the inner pyramidal, and finally lamina 6 that is polymorphic. That's the typical pattern of most, most of the neocortex. Now, when you go into the striated cortex, things are very uh, sharply demarcated as different. Uh, the molecular layer, layer 1, is the same, but there you have a layer 2 and 3 fused and it's very granular, the, 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 the cellular composition are very small cells, all right? Then the layer four that, was, that is here in blue for the regular cortex, you see that becomes much thickened. It's much thicker than this, all right? And is this layer that in the middle has this white matter, white matter uh, layer that is called the stripe of genari, all right? And you see that there are, as I listed here, you don't have to remember it uh, or, or be taxed by it, but it has various subdivisions 
there is a 4a, 4b, 4c alpha, 4c beta. And we'll see the meaning of that in a moment, at least the, the concept. And finally, you have a pyramidal, an inner pyramidal layer that, con that contains large pyramids that are called the solitary cells of minor. And finally, layer 6, the polymorphic, is about the same. Now, when you record from cells, you know that we have dealt with recording of ganglion cells in the retina and geniculate cells in the geniculate. Now we are recording from cells in the cortex. You stick an electrode and start putting stimuli and, and see whether the, the discharge frequency of the neuron changes. So what's going to happen in that case? Well, uh, we are trying to define the characteristics of the receptive fields of, this, of the striped cortex neurons, all right? And you will see that the neuron that receives, the neurons that receive the input from the, cord from the optic radiation are all in layer 4, right? And when you record the activity of neurons in layer 4, you see that the receptive fields are still similar to the retina, they are still similar to the geniculate, which means that the receptive field is a center-surround antagonistic organization. Right? Uh, on the other hand, if your electrode, instead of hitting layer 4, you're, you're putting the electrode perpendicular to the surface, they hit neurons in layer 2, or in layer 3, or in layer 5, then you see that the receptive field loses its concentric characteristic, and now it becomes elongated. There may be, they are still, they are still uh, antagonistic regions within the field, you know, on and off, but the shape of the field is no longer circular and concentric. Now, these, uh, these cortical cells with the elongated fields can be also various types of increasing complexity and sampling different attributes of the stimuli. For instance, you have something called simple cells, or can be a complex cell. We'll see in a moment. In a simple cell, what's happening is that the, the stimulus, either for simple or complex cells, for these cells that the field is elongated, you can understand that the ideal stimulus for that is not anymore a spot of light, a circular spot of light, but actually an elongated bar, let's say, it's that means that the, stimul the, uh, the critical stimulus, instead of being circular, is a bar of light. Now, once you go into a bar of light, uh, let's see what happens, for instance. This, uh, these are examples of visual fields uh, of the simple cells, all right? Uh, and also, uh, I beg your pardon, also the complex cells, all these cells that are not concentric, the, the receptive field. In this case, you have a, a, an off-center on surround, right? In an elongated fashion. You can have the same as before with the concentric, you can have the reverse. You can have a center on and surrounded by areas of inhibition on each side. Now, you also can have, instead of having like a center surround organization, you can have just two bands parallel bands in which one piece of the band is excitatory and next to it there is a band that is inhibitory. And the reverse is true also, in which the initial band is inhibitory and is uh, just uh, um, alongside it is a band of excitation. So this is characteristic of these neurons uh, that are not in layer 4, that are in all the other layers of the cortex. Now. When once the stimulus becomes a bar instead of a spot, you are adding an attribute here, which is the orientation of the bar. You know, a circle, a spot is always the same. It's always the same, no matter how you slice it. But the bar, it can be a bar that is vertical or horizontal or any oblique bars. And what happens is that all neurons within about 100 microns cylinder, let's say, column, all right, have the same preferred orientation. What does it mean? Well, uh, I, I, it means, you know, of course, these except for layer 4 that, that they are concentric. I don't want to repeat that. 
But in any case, you have here a piece of striated cortex, as we did before, with all the lamina and subdivisions and all that. And you have now a very a, a stimulus that is a vertical line, a vertical bar of light. And you see that all the neurons in this column, when you put the electrodes and record from them, they all have this preferred orientation. If the bar is vertical, they respond you know, with an increase in, uh, in, uh, in frequency. And when, the, uh, when the, the bar is away from the vertical, they just are not interested. They are not responding much, all right? But now you go to a next, a next column of cortex near this one, and the preferred orientation is not an oblique line of this sort. And then you have go another one, and the obliquity is increased. Eventually, you go to another bar, another column, in which the preferred orientation is horizontal instead of vertical. And you keep on going that way. You know, each column has its own preferred orientation. All the neurons within the column respond preferentially to a particular orientation. Now, that means that simple cells in the striated cortex can be interpreted in the following way. Actually, this was the interpretation that originally was offered by, by uh, Hubert and Weasel that got Nobel Prizes and, uh, and uh, that were not uh, <laughs> believed too seriously, but now there is ample evidence that they were right in the interpretation. For instance, you have a cell of layer four, right? That are concentric fields. This is the first layer of input. So you have this thing here. You have a, a, a neuron in layer four, as you can see, with this concentric center surround organization. And you have now another cell that has a similar organization, but in different spots of the visual field. And then you have another cell with another of these uh, um, uh, receptive fields, and you have even a fourth cell that has even an overlapping um, receptive field with the previous one. So all these are, are cells in layer four, all right? But they are so arranged, it so happened, that these four neurons are so arranged that the receptive fields are some kind of registered along a certain orientation. Now, if these neurons now contact a simple cell, the receptive field of this simple cell will be the sum of the receptive fields of the other of the um, of the layer four cells that were impinging on it, and therefore uh, you can sum up these receptive fields in this fashion, and that will make will result in this kind of receptive field. All right, with a elongated field with a center that is excited and a surround that is inhibited. So this will be now a simple cell that appears in all the other layers but layer four. Now we are uh, we uh, discussed also or, or we mentioned also the possibility of a complex cell. So what is a complex cell? Is within that same column with that same preferred orientation. All right. But you can interpret that in this fashion, that now simple cells with elongated fields in register, for instance, this cell, this is the receptive field, and this cell, this will be the receptive field, and this one will be this, and this one will be that. So now, if these cells now are connecting to another neuron that is of the complex character, now you can interpret that the receptive field of this complex neuron will be the sum of these elongated fields that are in register. So that means that the receptive field will be much larger, will be of this extent, all right? And interestingly enough, you can put that bar, that stimulus bar, in any position of that receptive field, and it will keep on uh, stimulating that complex neuron, all right? No, moreover, not only is that the case, but also, not only the orientation is the characteristic that the cell is sampling, but it's also the direction of this movement that we are putting in this, uh, in this particular example. So we, we move that bar of light across the field in this direction of the arrow, the cell is excited. And it so happened 
that if we do the reverse, we move this, this uh, bar of light in the other direction, the neuron will not react. All right. So we have now um, established uh, the concept of this columnar organization at, this, at the visual cortical level. It's made of columns, about 100 microns in diameter, cylinders, and all the cells within that column respond to an elongated field of certain orientation. And moreover, complex cells will respond the same to that orientation, but also to movement across the field and in a particular direction. Because you have already now here in the cortex gadgets that will sample uh, not only the level of brightness or, or contrast of the stimulus, but also the orientation of the stimulus and the direction of movement. This is already at the cortical level. Now you have another situation that you remember that perhaps that the input from each eye that was segregated in the, in the more peripheral portions of the optic pathway and that remains segregated in the geniculate. Remember that the contralateral eye was, the fibers from contralateral eye were terminated in lamina 1, 4, and 6, whereas the input from the ipsilateral eye was terminated in lamina 2, 3, and 5. And when the geniculate projects to the cortex, that input remains also segregated. So you will have now columns, pieces of cortex, all right, that goes through all the lamina, all right, that will respond mostly to the left eye. And then you will have nearby another column, the, the cells of which will respond mostly to the right eye. These are what are called the ocular dominance columns that contain in itself all the other orientation columns for that particular eye. So you see how the process of information becomes more and more complex and taking into account more and more attributes of the visual stimulus. Now, one more thing before we finish this uh, topic. You have that these, uh, these columns of fornix have all these layers, right? One to six in the way that we discussed before. And now you, you see the following that if you take now the two ocular dominance columns for each eye, now you have the representation of the binocular field in that particular little piece of cortex that contains now all orientations for both eyes. And that's what is called the hypercolumn. The sum of the of two opposed ocular dominance columns. One more piece of information that is uh, quite interesting is that lamina 3 contains um, groups of cells within several columns, all right? Group, actually, from all the columns, contains group of cells that uh, this group, for a, uh, a lack of a better word, uh, are denominated uh, um, blobs, blobs of cells. And these blobs of cells within lamina 3 are very much responding to color. And they have, they have what is called a concentric uh, double opponent color uh, cells. Remember that the retina and the geniculate have the single opponent, where red stimulated the center and green stimulated the surround. Are double color opponent cells, that the center is stimulated by red and inhibited by green, whereas the surround will be inhibited by red and excited by green. So this is what is called the double color opponent cell that can have a function particularly for, uh, for, for uh, contrast, so particular meta-contrast that we, do, we don't have to discuss at this point. All right, so this is in layer three characteristic. Now, what we can derive from all this? Well, that the, these segregated inputs of various attributes of the stimulus that occurred from the retina to the geniculate and to the beginning of the process in the cortex uh, are sampling different attributes of the stimuli. Now, you know that movement and course outlines were carried by the 
magnocellular ganglion cell and for the M, M cells in the geniculate and they do come here to, as we're going to see, to terminate in layer 4C alpha. They terminate there. And from C alpha, they send information to 4B and to other layers of the column. And that's how the initial steps of the analysis of movement and course outlines occurs. But you have also the other channel that analyzes form, all right? And form is carried by P retinal ganglion cells, feeding into P geniculate cells, and terminating in layer 4C beta of the striate cortex. And from that, it goes to layers 2 and 3, to the inter blobs, not to the blobs that had to do with color, just with the regions of lamina 2, 3 that are not dealing with color. They are dealing essentially with form. And then to other layers of cortex, all right? Finally, you have analysis of color that are carried on by, again, P retinal ganglion cells and further processed by the P geniculate cells and terminating now in layer 4C beta, the same as those for form, but then projecting to the layers 2, 3 blobs that contains the double color opponent cells. And finally, it goes to other layers. Now, this is the first processing of information in three separate channels for the, um, for the cortical um, networks. And whatever processing occurs, the output of this network is going to go to other cortical areas. And so there will be an area V2 and an area V3 and an area V4 where mapping of the visual fields will be still present, but with various additional attributes. And finally, this, uh, this visual processing are occurring through three or four regions of the cortex will then converge with other sensory information from other sensory systems. This is essentially uh, what I wanted to tell you about the visual system so we can review it briefly as take-home messages. All right? First of all, you have that the maculopapillar bundle, remember in, from the, in the retina, is the most sensitive to problems with the optic nerve fibers and therefore any pathology affecting the optic nerve of any, from any direction uh, will result in a central scotoma in the visual field of the corresponding eye. All right? Of course, if the optic nerve is totally sectioned, it would be a total blindness of that eye. But any other pathology of the optic nerve will give you a central scotoma. That's what is called the prechiasmatic pattern. Then the decusating nasal fibers of each retina that occurs in the optic chiasm are the most sensitive, sensitive to alteration. And therefore, anything that happens to the chiasm, again, in any direction, will result in 95% of the times in bitemporal field defects. That can be a main obsess if they are full, or they can be just uh, small areas of the, of the field uh, blind but those areas are in the temporal fields of each eye. That's the typical chiasmatic pattern dysfunction. On the other hand, behind the chiasm, call it the optic tract or the, the, tem or the lateral geniculate or the optic radiation, so even the occipital lobe or the parietal lobe, whatever there is visual pathways, they will have a problem or that is characterized by um, the contralateral homonymous uh, pattern, which is the retrochiasmatic pattern of, um, of dysfunction. Um, a, a, a one characteristic retrochiasmatic pattern that is little different from the rest is when you are uh, having the lesion, let's say, in the temporal, rostral temporal lobe, affecting what was Meyer's loop, that were these looping fibers 
that are looking at the superior field. And therefore, you will have here a contralateral homonymous superior quadrantanopsia. Now, remember well that inputs from the two systems, the M and the P, retinal ganglion cells of each eye, remain segregated in different layers of the lateral geniculate nucleus. And that the lateral geniculate nucleus, being a complex thalamic network, takes care of further processing of the visual information uh, through more inhibitory processes and also to gate that information according to the state of consciousness. Now, the, uh, the lateral geniculate nucleus operate differently in the waking state and in the sleeping state, but we'll discuss this in more detail when we discuss thalamus. And uh, finally, the visual cortex now is organized in columns, uh, in columns that include all the layers through, and there are cells uh, in so-called orientation columns that respond to a particular orientation, and then there is ocular dominance columns in which the input still is segregated for each eye, and then the combination of two ocular dominant columns of opposite eyes forming what is called the hypercolumn that is made of two ocular dominance columns, one for each eye. Finally, the analysis of movement, form, and color remains segregated during the first stages of cortical processing, and the results of which are projected to other cortical areas. All right, hope that you have time to digest all this material. That is a lot, but that's how the field is going. Thank you.